Angela, I don't think we've met. Oh, hello, before, Angela. But we've never shared voice before. Oh, thank you. It's nice hearing from you too. Yeah, you have a connection of the ACT, so right? Right, right, right. Yeah, you have that connection. Uh, who else? About please tell us where you're joining from in the chat. Oh, oh, okay, thank, thank you very much. Chris Penchuome joining from Zimbabwe in Harare. Ah, nice to see you, Crispin. Thank you, You're Irene. Welcome. How are you, Irene? This I'm very afternoon? well. I'm very well. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. Hello, Pauline. Hi, Pauline. Hi there. <laughs> How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. And you? Oh, fantastic. I am great. I am wonderful. We have sun, we have a bit of sunshine, so I'm happy. You know, sunshine brings a lot of happiness. Yeah, so it does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And you're joining us from Pauline? Um, Kells River in Cape Town. Oh, I see. Okay. Is there some rain? Some? No, no, no. We're very happy. Our dam's 100% full. <laughs> ah. <laughs> China. <laughs> okay. Nice to meet you, Pauline. Thank you. Nice Appreciate to meet you. you. Okay, we are we we still have a few minutes, and we'll give um, a few more minutes before we uh, we we start. So thank you for being here. Yes, Kutama from Ethiopia, Dila University. Yes. Hello. 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 Hi. We, you know, you are usually faint, Kutema. You are very faint uh, when you use your mic. Yes, but I log in by desktop. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, we desktop we can hardly hear you. Camera, no camera. Please continue um, introducing yourselves in the chat. Tell us where you're joining us from. We still have a minute to go. Um, however, I think we give um, another few minutes um, for people to join us. Similarities. <laughs> <laughs> So good afternoon, everyone. Um, we are so happy to have you. Uh, my name is Irene Mawel. I am speaking with you from a coastal town in uh, Kenya called Malindi. I am really delighted to have uh, Dr. Angela Benson, uh, who is from the University of Alabama, who has really agreed and 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 kindly agreed to be here um, to talk to us about the challenges of uh, EdTech response to COVID uh, and the similarities in the US and in Namibia where she had the opportunity of doing some work. She'll be introducing herself a bit more and telling us a bit of the work that she did. And we will have an opportunity to have a hearty discussion with her so um, please be ready uh, to type in any questions that you may have and any, any um, observations and any insights. Uh, we will try to take um, uh, questions in between or at the end, depending on how it goes. Another one thing is that we will switch off our videos because of connectivity. Some people struggle with data. So it, we realize that in Zoom, it also affects other people, not just our data. 
So we will switch off our videos so that it doesn't affect other people. So do not wonder why we are not on. So um, Angela, hi there. Hi. I will stop sharing mine and you can share yours now. Okay. Okay then. Thank you. Thank you. Now, are we seeing what we should be seeing? I think so. Uh, yes, we are seeing what we should be seeing, Angela, yes. Okay, great. Uh, good morning. Oh, well, I'm going to say good morning, uh, but I know it's afternoon for you. It's I'm in Atlanta, Georgia in the U.S., and it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And that's something that I always have to remember. Uh, so what we're going to do this morning is I'm going to do a little bit of talking, and hopefully we will get an opportunity to do some discussion before it's over. What I'd like to do is I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, why I was in, uh, about my Fulbright experience to Namibia. Uh, so I wanna spend a few minutes talking about that because that sets, sets the context for my experience. Then I wanna talk about uh, one, of the, one of the most interesting things that I found during my Fulbright was how very similar the University of Namibia, which is where I was, was to my home university. So what I wanna talk about are those similarities. I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna compare the school two schools so you see the same similarities that I saw. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna look at the two schools um, at their ed tech pre-COVID configurations. Like what, what kinds of things were these two schools doing before the lockdown and everybody had to go to this emergency remote teaching. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that for the two schools, but I'm also gonna do it a little bit for the, for the primary and secondary schools across the country. So we're gonna look at across the country and then we're gonna look at, instead of across the whole US, we're gonna look at the state of Alabama, which is where, I, which is where my university is. And then we're gonna spend some time looking at the COVID challenges that, uh, that were faced. And I think the most surprising thing to me is that the university, I mean, is that the University of Namibia and the University of Alabama basically made the same choices about how to handle this, um, how to handle the lockdown. Uh, and we ran into a lot of the same problems. Same thing with our K-12 schools. I think what we found, and when I say K-12, I mean primary and secondary and pre-primary, I think, from, from the language that we used in Namibia. So, uh, so I think it was interesting that we, we, we went to the same solutions and we had the same problems with those solutions. So let's just go ahead and move forward a little bit. Um, okay. Okay, I was a Fulbright Scholar uh, and I had a teaching research award at the, to the University of Namibia. Uh, my husband and I arrived in Vindhoek uh, on January of 2019. We were supposed to stay for 15 months, but we ended up staying for only 12 months because of the pandemic. Um, it was interesting how we had to leave Namibia and that on the day we were to leave seemed to be the day that the airport started shutting down international flights. And then, and then they shut down flights to South Africa. And if you're in Namibia and you can't get to South Africa and you can't get a direct international flight out, you stay in Namibia because there's no other way to get out. And so we ended up on a, a charter flight from the Peace Corps in order to get us out of the country. So. My husband and I were not really ready to go. We were very, 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 very sad. I think my husband kept saying, can't we stay, can't we stay? But uh, the Fulbright said we had to come home. And so that's what we ended up doing. But uh, Namibia really did become our second home. Uh, I was, like I said, I was, we were at the University of Namibia and I was in the Faculty of Education. Uh, like at my home university where I'm in the Educational Technology Program, at the University of Namibia, 
I was also with the educational technology faculty. Uh, during the time that um, I was there, I taught an undergraduate course in educational technology for fourth year students. And I taught uh, three master's courses. So the, the undergraduate course was the first year and the master's courses were the second year. And after, even after we left Namibia, uh, we were doing that master's program online, which was the first time though that program had been offered online. And so even though they sent us back home, I was able to finish that course up. Fortunately, it met at 3.30 in the afternoons. So when I got home, it was 9.30 in the morning. So that worked out really well. So also while I was in um, on my Fulbright and in Namibia, uh, my husband and I were able to go on the Fulbright Regional Travel Program. And during that, we spent two weeks in Nairobi at the United States International University, Kenya. And even though that's called the United States International University, it's actually a Kenyan school um, that has accreditation both in Kenya and in the US, but it is not a US institution. It's a Kenyan institution. So I, we, we, we spent two weeks in Kenya working with a colleague at uh, USIU. So that was my exposure to Africa from 2009 through two, I'm sorry, from 2019 to 2020. Um, about 15 years ago, I had been to South Africa and my husband and I did get to go to Johannesburg and spend some time at the apartheid museum. So, but we didn't get to spend as much time as we would like in South Africa. My husband had never been before, but I'd been to uh, Johannesburg and of course to Cape Town because everybody has to go to Robben Island. And um, I was at a conference at the University of Stellenbosch. And that's when I got a chance to explore uh, a bit of South Africa. So uh, that's sort of what my African experience has been recently. And I have to tell you that I really think that, I know that it was a monumental impact on my life personally. And I also think professionally. And I don't know why it was such a, it was such a magnitude thing for me, but I was just, it was very eye-opening just to see how similar we were as countries. And it made me think about all the room that there is for collaboration. It made me think about how our problems are very much the same problems. So if we have the same problems, why aren't we coming up with common solutions that both of us can use? And so that's the point that I'm gonna to get to in this presentation. And I, but I also want to tell you about one more thing in case you don't know. There's another program called Fulbright Africa. When I was in Namibia, one of my colleagues in the educational technology program spent six months at the University of Hawaii here in the, here in the US on a Fulbright. So if you're interested in traveling to the US, I suggest that you check with your embassy and find out about Fulbright Africa if you don't already know about it. My uh, colleague from the University of Namibia was on a curriculum. I think there are three different things you can do. One is curriculum, one, one is research, and I can't recall the other one, I'm sorry at this time, but my uh, colleague was on a curriculum one. And so what she did is she went to the University of Hawaii to compare their online, their master's program with the University of Namibia's master's program and to begin to think about what it meant to move the University of Namibia's master's program online like the people had done at the University of Hawaii. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, if you're interested. So I would just recommend that if you would like to partake of that, please contact your embassies. And the uh, Fulbright is, you know, Fulbright takes care of the travel, Fulbright takes care of the housing while you're away, and then Fulbright gives you a stipend uh, to live on while you're gone. So it becomes something that becomes uh, very much affordable because Fulbright picks up the expenses. Okay, okay. Are there any questions about that before I move on? 
Um, I found the link, so I've shared it in the chat. About oh, okay. Fulbright. Yes. Yeah, so yes. Okay. Great. So no, no questions yet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now, well, the next thing I want to do is sort of talk about my university, the University of Alabama. If you look at this map of the U.S., this is where Alabama is. Alabama is this yellow box. We're in the southernmost part. Well, almost as we're in the southern, we're in the southeastern region of the U.S. My university. Uh oh, that was me. Sorry about that. Oh, my university. Is, is located about where this red dot is. It's almost on the Mississippi line. Oh man, I gotta stop doing that, sorry. Um, so every time I ask somebody in Namibia, had they heard of Alabama and did they know where it was? I usually got no, <laughs> which I thought was sort of funny. Uh, so if you don't know about Alabama, here we are. You probably heard of Georgia and Atlanta and uh, so that's that's uh, Georgia, and then that's Florida. A lot of people had heard of Florida, so that's where we are. Uh, our university is characterized as a very high research activity university, which means that research is a priority for us, even though our sign says teaching, research, and service. In terms of priority, we're quickly moving to uh, research, teaching, and service. In the state of Alabama, which is where I showed you with the yellow square, our population is 4.9 million people. So I want you to remember that number. In terms of area, the state is about 53,000 square miles. Uh, the, the, the town that I live in, Tuscaloosa, has a population of about 101,000 people. Our university is the biggest university in the state. And on the Tuscaloosa campus, there are 38,000 students. Uh, every year we enroll about 7,000 freshmen and our graduate students are increasing. Uh, I think we had about 6,000 students this year. And our university is a predominantly white school, which is how we characterize schools in the university. We, I mean, in the US, we have predominantly white institutions. We have historically uh, black colleges and universities. We have Hispanic serving universities. We have tribal colleges and universities. So there are different ways that we characterize universities. And uh, in this case, the, our university is a predominantly white institution. That means 75% of the students are white um, and 10% are black and the remaining are other nationalities. And in terms of our faculty, 79% of our faculty are white at the University of Alabama. Now let's look at the University of Namibia. Uh, the University of Namibia, and now I'm going to compare the country of Namibia to the state of Alabama. When we saw before, the state of Alabama had 4.7 million people. The country of Namibia has about 2.4 million people. If you look at the area, which is about maybe a little bit less than half, a little bit more than half of the people that are in Alabama. In terms of area, the University of Namibia is 300, I mean, I'm sorry, the country of Namibia is 319,000 square miles. So we're looking at the country is six times bigger than the state of Alabama. And if we look at the population of Windhoek, which is where I was, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I usually just say Windhoek. I pronounce it like a W, but you're supposed to pronounce it with a V. So there are about 280,000 people in Windhoek. Whereas in my hometown, the unit where, where the University of Tuscaloosa is, there are only 100,000 people. Um, the enrollment at the University of Namibia is about 30,000 stu 30, students. Whereas at the university where I am, there are 38,000 students. And that's me down in the corner at, at one of the UNAM campuses across the, across the state. 
And if you look at the, the Namibia, I was here. I was right here in the middle in, in, in Windhoek, which is the capital of Namibia. My husband and I were able to travel as far down as, oh, we went way far down. We probably went about that far down. And then we went that far over. We went up the coast. We went up there. We went over there. And before we left, if we had not had to leave, our next trip was going to be over here to the Zambezi region. We also made it up there. So we were able to see a lot of the country. We were able to meet a lot of the people. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. So we have to go back. We're going back next summer if, uh, if the pandemic allows us to travel. Um, so to look at some similarities that are beyond those things, if you look at the University of Alabama and you look at the University of Namibia, that's the, that's the gate, that's the back gate that gets you to the campus. If you look at them there, in terms of the things that we were doing, there were lots of similarities. At, at both schools, there was a focus on research. Uh, the University of Namibia was uh, encouraging faculty to increase their research efforts. Uh, students were uh, engaged in research. So there was a focus on undergraduate research. And the, those were the same kinds of things that we're doing at the University of Alabama. We had gone from a high research intensive university to a very high research intensive university, just showing you what our focus is on research. And that's the same focus that we had at the University of Alabama. Um, uh, there was a growing focus on experiential learning at the University of Namibia. And we were doing that same thing. That was one of our big projects at the University of Alabama. And what I also found interesting is that at the University of Alabama, during the time when I was in Namibia, we started something that we call the General Education Task Force. And that means we were looking at, uh, at how we had our education structured on campus and if we needed to, how we had our programs and courses structured on campus and how those needed to be changed. And believe it or not, they were doing the same thing at the University of Namibia. They were taking a fresh look at their curriculum, their course offering, and their programs to see what changes needed to be made for the future. So in some ways, I felt very much at home. So I was in a situation that was very much like my home situation, but there were some differences in our context. So let's go a little bit further. Are there any questions at this point, Irene? Uh, not yet, not okay. yet. Uh, I think they're absorbing, they're absorbing. Okay, that's fine. I'm just going <laughs> to check in every now and then. <laughs> Thank you, uh, that's wonderful. Okay. So now I want to talk about what technology looked like, what educational technology looked like on the two campuses. At the university, both schools had uh, course management systems. At the University of Alabama, we use Blackboard, which is a commercial system. And I don't know how much money they charge us a year but it's pretty expensive. At the University of Namibia, they use Moodle. And as you all know, Moodle is open source. And so um, I don't think they paid a lot for it and there was not a yearly fee because they have the source code on uh, their computer, I mean, on their servers at the University of Namibia and they have an administrative staff who manages that service. At the University of Alabama, we have a support team as well, but we don't have access to the Blackboard, um, uh, what do you call it, source code, because we are just, uh, we are just uh, licensing the system. Um, in terms of how we use Blackboard at the University of Alabama, every course that's offered at the University of Alabama gets a Blackboard shell. It doesn't matter if you've asked for it. It doesn't even matter if you use it. By definition, Every course that's in our world in the, that we are offering in a particular semester has a Blackboard shell associated with it. Some and teachers use that, um, that Blackboard shell however they please. Some instructors don't use it at all. Some instructors primarily use it 
for testing and other instructors use it more as an ongoing supplement for their courses. And there are some, in, some, in, some instructors who actually start to create online versions of their course. In particular, uh, most of the way I teach online courses and I teach That's campus really courses. So for my campus courses, I, um, I usually have all my course content in Blackboard so that that's where my students go to find out where their work is. And a lot of professors do that. Now, if you have an online course, um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, that's my last item. Uh, so both the University of Alabama and the University of Namibia use Panopto for their uh, video recording in their online courses. And I found that interesting. When I got to the University of Namibia, they were using Panopto. But when I left the University of Alabama, we were using something else, and I can't even remember what it is now. Uh, for lecture capturing, that's what we were doing. We were using something called Tegrity for lecture capturing. But while I was in Namibia, the University of Alabama adopted Panopto. So both the University of Namibia and the University of Alabama were using Panopto for their lecture capturing. At the University of Alabama, I think we were using Zoom a bit more than people at the University of Namibia were using Zoom. But they also used Zoom. And they had access to another uh, video chat system called, I don't quite know what it was. I, hope I'm, I didn't look this up, but it's, but it's called Big Blue Button, I think. I can't, I think that's what it is. I should have looked it up before yes, I put it. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. it is. Yeah. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never used that. Uh, for me, I had to go from Blackboard to Moodle when I was in the when I when I was in Namibia, and that was an interesting challenge. I had used Blackboard before, but I wasn't as familiar with it as I was with uh, uh, Blackboard because I hadn't used it. But uh, Moodle and I became friends, so I never used Big Blue Button. I always used Zoom. Another thing is that at the University of Namibia, there was a heavy use of WhatsApp which was something that I had not experienced in the US. Well, in fact, I didn't get WhatsApp until I found out I was going on this Fulbright because that was an easy way for me to keep in connection. But what I found is that students and faculty alike were very much on WhatsApp. The faculty in the, the faculty of education, everybody in there was in a WhatsApp group. And basically that's how we shared news amongst the faculty members. Um, I don't want to, we also used email, but I want to say that the, the more timely stuff came out across WhatsApp. More discussions went on on WhatsApp than went on in email. But what was interesting on the course side is that my students automatically created a WhatsApp group for my class. So when I had my fourth year students in that educational technology group, on their own, they created a WhatsApp group and they used that group to support themselves in the course. Now, it was funny. In the beginning, they invited me to join the WhatsApp group and I did join it because it was easy access for them to talk to me. But I had to leave the WhatsApp group. And the reason I had to leave the WhatsApp group is because, you know, when students are talking to each other, it's different than students talking to you. So one student said, has anybody looked at assignment one? Uh, I haven't looked at it yet. Assignment one was due that day. So that made me a bit frustrated that on the day the assignment was due, students hadn't even read the, read the assignment. So I told them that I needed to leave the group and uh, I had a contact person. So if they, needed to, if they needed something urgent from me, that my contact person in the group would WhatsApp me. And if I had messages to the group, I would send them to my contact person and my contact person would post it to the group. That went really well. But one thing that I was really impressed about in that WhatsApp group was like if somebody, somebody would say, I'm having a problem with something that they had to do for class. And then another student would pipe in, I'm going to be at the library at one o'clock so, so I can help you. And so that's the way my students used WhatsApp to support themselves. And I was very, very impressed by that. Now, I honestly didn't have anything to match that with from my experience in the US. 
if we use anything similar, it's an app called GroupMe, but you don't really see students using that the same way they use WhatsApp. Um, my students have used a Facebook group uh, and my, my doctoral students have, but I haven't known my undergraduate students to do this grouping and these were undergraduates. So in terms of uh, uh, technical, uh, technical and, and instructional support, at the University of Alabama, we had two groups. One group was our College of Continuing Studies. In the College of Continuing Studies, if you had an online program, the College of Continuing Studies gave you instructional designers to help you build your courses for delivery online. They would actually put the course in Blackboard for you. You would tell them what needed to be in the course, what the assignments were, if you had any videos, that kind of thing, and they would physically put it in. And then we had another group called the Center for Instructional Technology that basically helped faculty to use technology in their face-to-face -face classes. So if you needed help with Blackboard, but you weren't in an online program, you went to this other group. So we sort of had two sources of support depending on the kind of programming that you were doing. At the University of Namibia, their support was through the Center for Open Distance and E-Learning, and they served everybody. If you were on campus and you wanted uh, technology help, they would do it. If you were doing a distance program, they were the people to support you, and they provided instructional designers to help you create your print materials because at the University of Namibia, distance meant print. And then the e-learning or the online, I mean the, on, the open distance and e-learning, they were making a move to online courses. So the, the Codell group would also give support to you if you were going online. So they supported uh, online, they supported print-based distance, and they also supported people doing uh, classroom technology integration. Uh, one thing that was different from the University of Alabama and the University of Namibia is that Moodle courses were not created for everybody. If you were teaching an online course, you got a Moodle course. But if you had an on-campus course and you wanted to use Moodle, you had to actually ask for it. So Moodle print penetration wasn't as deep across the campus as it was at the University of Alabama. Um, I guess at the University of Alabama, I would characterize our courses as primary hybrid or online. We have a growing online uh, set of online courses that are offered through our uh, College of Continuing Studies. Uh, in our educational technology program, we just introduced about three years ago an online master's program in educational technology. Um, most of our courses that are taught on the campus, I would say are hybrid because people love using Blackboard to give tests. They just like that because of some of the security features and how all students can take the test at the same time. And there are a lot of self-grading capabilities. At the University of Namibia, uh, I would say that distance is probably the biggest, but it's going down as online is coming in place. And I would say that hybrid with your on-campus people is probably the lesser. So these were the environments that we were in before we had the lockdown. So um, let's- Angela? Yes. There is um, um, Dr. Nicola Pallet from the uh, Rhodes University says that Panopto is uh, quite expensive and I'm just wondering are you, why are you using it if it's expensive and, or is it subsidized for you? And then- Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, and then there's, uh, uh, someone wants to know when you say hybrid, what do you mean? Is it blended? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. So those are the yes. two questions, yes. Yes, when I say hybrid, I mean blended. So it's a blended course, means some of it is online, some of it is face-to-face. Now, Panopto, now that's interesting. Now, I was under the impression when I was at, at the University of Namibia that Panopto was open source. So it's not open source, Nicola? 
Nicola, would you like to? Oh, okay. Would you like to say something, please? Hi, sure. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can. <laughs> yeah, Thank unfortunately, you. it's not open source, um, you know, because I've been inquiring about it and, yeah, it's actually really expensive. Well, I cannot imagine because, you know, the University of Namibia is using uh, Moodle. I cannot imagine them uh, paying a lot to use Panopto. So what I can do is I can put you in touch with one of my colleagues at the University of Namibia and you can talk to them about how they've gotten that because I, oh, you can try it. For, I think this might have changed since we looked at it last time. Okay, that'll be great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, because maybe they, because this page now does say 30 day trial. But I remember when I first started using it in Namibia, it was free. You know something, and I'm gonna I'm gonna not get stuck on this. Now I could be wrong about that, but I could also be right. Have you all noticed that there are a lot of things on the internet that start out as free, and as soon as they get a lot of customers, all of a sudden they start charging? Oh yes. Anybody <laughs> notice that? Oh yes, uh, most of the things. Yes. I hate that. In my classes, I use a lot of free tools, and every year I have to go back and check: is it still free? I'm like, that makes me upset, but let's move on. Did I answer both questions, Irene? Yes, you did, okay. and thank you, yes. So now let's look at primary and secondary education in Alabama and in Namibia. Once again, you can see how very similar our schools are. In Namibia, I mean, in Alabama, we have about 42,000 teachers. In Namibia, they have 30,000. In Alabama, we have about 744,000 students. In Namibia, they have about 800,000 students. In Alabama, we have 1,659 schools. And all these are public schools. I'm not counting any private schools in either of these numbers. So in the US, in, the, in Alabama, we have about 1,659 schools. And in Namibia, they have 1,900, <coughs> excuse me, they have 1,920 schools. So our sizes are really about the same. They do have more. Anyway, we're in the same ballpark. So if we look at what our pre-COVID ed tech configurations are, and my students in Namibia helped me to come up with this. I had three categories, and we ended up breaking it up into more than three categories. One configuration, and it's interesting to me that these configurations exist both in Namibia and in Alabama. And I say that because sometimes people refer to Namibia as a developing country. And I really don't like that terminology. So I got to come up with something else. Uh, I think Nicola uses Global South. Uh, anyway, but uh, I got to find another way to think about it. But people think about how the US is just so far advanced from everybody else. And I think as we're going to talk further, what we're gonna see is that when this pandemic hit and we had to go into lockdown, we realized how similar the US is to everybody else in the world. So kind of here we go. So when we look at the pre-COVID ed tech configurations, these, were, these are based on my observations and my students' observations as we looked at what scenarios we had to work in as educational technologists. The first scenario was what we termed the one computer classroom. Now, what that means is that in that school, the only person that has a computer for teaching and learning is the teacher herself. This may be a computer provided by the school, or this may be the teacher's personal computer. In some situations, as we talked about when we were with my students in Namibia, that computer might be a smartphone. So we have the one computer classroom. Now there were distinctions in that one computer classroom. It could be a one computer classroom where the school has internet and that computer can connect to the internet. But it could also be a one computer classroom where that school does not have internet and internet access is provided via a hotspot, either on somebody, either a separate hotspot or a hotspot from somebody's uh, cell phone. And as my students in Namibia made me aware, 
there are some schools that did not have electricity. So your one computer classroom computer was actually running on its battery and maybe or maybe a or a generator if the school had one accessible for you that way. So that one computer classroom was our lowest level of technology access at a school. So the things that we had to think about in that scenario were how do we, what is effective technology integration in a one computer classroom? And that scenario exists both in Alabama and in Namibia. I don't think we have, we don't have schools without electricity and most of our schools by mandate of the state have some form of internet access in them. And then we had the computer lab without internet. I think when I first did this for my students, I had computer lab with internet and they told me, no, we need another category, computer lab without internet. And so, we, so that gave us another scenario that we had to talk about. What technology integration activities did you have if your school had a computer lab but it didn't have internet. So this scenario existed more in Namibia than it existed in Alabama. Then we had the computer lab with internet, which is pretty common in Alabama schools. Um, and then we had the mobile computer lab. This is where you could actually, instead of students going to the computer lab, you had laptops or some kind of mobile devices on some kind of cart and you could take that cart to individual classrooms for teachers and students to use. Uh, that was becoming common. That was a growing way of doing things in the US and I think we're doing it, but what we're beginning to see now is what some of our schools are doing is they're going to a one-to-one -one computing scenario. That means that every student in the school and usually it's not the whole school, they'll pick a grade level. Every student in maybe six to eight grade or eight to 10 grade or 10 to 12 grade, whatever, however that school chooses to start, everybody will be given a computer. And so now we have one, that's why they call it one-to-one -one computing because every student has a computing device. Now that device in some cases is provided by the school, but other schools have something called bring your own device. So students are able to bring their own devices to class and the school only supports those students who don't have devices. So as we started moving into COVID, these were the different environments that we had. Are there any, any, any additional questions, Irene? Uh, no, none. Uh, we are just sharing uh, links here with uh, a few people, yeah. So not oh, okay. yet, yeah. So let's move on. I think I'm talking too slow. So let's get to our challenges. And these were challenges that we found both in Namibia and in Alabama, both at the University of Namibia and at the University of Alabama and in our primary and secondary schools. I think the first thing was time. Uh, when I, in the, at the University of Namibia, COVID hit right around the time that we were about to do a, a semester break. I think we were about to go away for like a week. And that was actually about the same time that the University of Alabama was in. In fact, my niece who's a student at the University of Alabama didn't know they were gonna close the school until she was at the airport getting ready to go home for spring break. So what we did at the University of Alabama, which is also what they did at the University of Namibia is basically say, Instead of taking one week for spring break, the students got a chance to take two weeks. And during that extra week, the faculty were supposed, the faculty, the teachers and the, and the lecturers and the faculty, which is what we call them in Alabama, were supposed to put their courses online, make their courses available so that their students could access them online. Now, those of us who are in ed tech, when we sit back and think about this, we go, you know, that's crazy. How are you gonna put all these courses online in two weeks? But you know, miracle of miracles, people were able to do it. So in addition to putting courses online, which was much easier at the higher edge, at the uh, 
college level than it was at the pre at the prime pre pre primary primary and primary and secondary levels. And so what they found themselves doing is preparing workshop worksheets for teachers to come pick up. So there was a lot there was a lot of churning around um, in that two weeks trying to get that together. Uh, and another thing, not only I think people thought, and I don't know, I don't think this was us as educational technology people thinking this, but people thought, oh, just push that stuff online and start teaching. Well, what we found is that teachers didn't know how to teach online. We found that in the US and we found that in Namibia. So teachers don't, not all teachers at the University of Alabama, everybody had access to Blackboard, so everybody had a Blackboard shell, but it didn't mean that everybody was using it. So there was a segment, and I think it actually was the smaller segment of faculty who had never used Blackboard before. And at the University of Alabama, at, at Namibia, there was an even larger segment of faculty who had never used Moodle before. So somehow we expected that in two weeks, we were gonna put these courses online and then magically, everybody was going to know how to teach them. I thought that was a bit much. Anyway, I would just say that's not enough time. What do you all think? Another thing that we found in both spaces was at lack of access and technology support. What we found very much in Alabama and at the University of Alabama and at our schools is that while students had access to the internet at school, when they went home, it was a totally different thing. So some students did have access at home, but a lot of students didn't. Uh, what we found is that if you were in a family that had three or four kids who were in school, not all families got three or four computers so that every kid has their own computer. So then how do you do schoolwork when every kid needs to be on the computer at the same time? And so these were just things that we had not really thought through. So what you then began to, to see schools do in the US is, well, how do we get extra computers to these students? But you then you know what happened? The people who produced the computers began to get a backlog. I was talking to a tech person at one of the local schools in Tuscaloosa, which is where I am. And he said that they had 2000 Chromebooks and some of you are familiar with Chromebook. They were on back order. Uh, it's the middle of September. School has already started. How's the computer on back order? And this is not even back in the spring when this first started. This is now in September when you, well, no, we're in October when you think we'd be farther along. But anyway, and that home and school access was the exact same uh, in Namibia. And it may have been, because at, at Namibia, uh, of course, we had a Students use a lot of computer of the computer labs at Namibia. And so once students can no longer be on campus, what do they do? Some students who are out at the farm, what do they do? Some students who are in areas where there is no access, what do they do? So some of this, we didn't kind of think through too much. But anyway, we began to do things. In Namibia, they began to, and I think very creative things. Like they began to negotiate with the telecom people who provided the internet to say like WhatsApp, you would get, if you had these different kinds of plans, you would get so much free WhatsApp. So they began to get in negotiations to see if we could uh, get uh, free time for Moodle. And so those kind of things people began to do. They began to provide students uh, hotspots that had more data on them or something like that. So those kind of things they began to do. Uh, so that's kind of where that was. So if you had any other things that you were doing at your schools, I would very much like to hear them. And let me keep going. Now, the thing is, if you look at the state of Alabama, if you look, there's a, if you see my arrow, uh, there's a wide swath that goes about right through here, through here, through here. Now, if you look at this map, you don't even have to look at the rest of the state. What you can say is, in all likelihood, at home, these people don't have very good internet access. That's because this segment of Alabama 
is called the Black Belt. And the Black Belt is renowned for having lower educational access in general, not even counting the, not even counting the internet, but just lower educational access, lots of poor people. And you know what happens to poor people? We're always behind the eight ball. And so it's almost like when we decided that we were gonna put everything online, we forgot about these people over here who don't have it. And I'm and I'm pointing at the black at the black belt, but there are other pockets around the state that are low income, low technology home access areas. And it seems like in some ways we just forgot about that. And I can say the same thing in Namibia. When you look here in the Windhoek, these are this is a high access area. I lived in Windhoek. Now I had a couple of problems with my internet, but hey, I had very good internet access. And most and a lot of people did. But then there were some people, like the people living in the informal settlements, who mostly depended on internet access from their phones. And some of them, the only internet access they had was from their phones. And then if you start going up here into the villages, um, they might not even have electricity. And then so and if you go to some of these other places, like around here, so it, it's almost like when we made that decision to, to go online, we forgot that everybody couldn't go online. And I don't see how we forgot that, but we forgot it. And if you agree with me or disagree with me, uh, you can let me know in the chat box. And then the, the second part of what we had was technology integration and instructional design support. That was a challenge. Once again, we put teachers, we expected teachers who had never taught online to all of a sudden be ready to teach online. What happened here, and right now I'm staying with my parents in uh, right side of Atlanta. Atlanta is a major metropolitan area in the state of Georgia. Atlanta is like the front running city in the state of Georgia. Please, uh, when, the, when the shutdown first happened back in March, the DeKalb County Schools, which is where I live, which is supposed to be a very good school district. After about one month, they basically shut down and said, we can't do this. This is not working for us. And they shut down there before the school year ended. They got a special mandate that said that they could close the school year early. The idea was, is that they would start earlier in the fall, but they just agreed that they were not ready for this that their teachers were not ready and that their students were not ready. Now, in the at the in the in uh, Namibia, I'm not sure I remember anybody shutting down, but this is what I do remember from one of my students. One of my students in the master's program, all my students in the master's program were teachers. And so we would talk about what are the things that they're doing during the lockdown. So they talked about getting their sheets, the worksheets to the parents and how they had struggles with some of that. They talked about how students were at the farm and they couldn't even get in touch with the students in order to tell them what the assignments were. But at one time, one of my students said, well, I'm using WhatsApp and we're doing all this. And she was telling us about all the great things that we're doing on WhatsApp. And so I said, well, how many students are participating? She said about 50. And I said, well, how many students do you have? She said about a hundred. So, well, you were doing very exciting things on WhatsApp, but if only half of your students are, are participating, that's a bit of an issue. And that was sort of a common issue that we saw across both Alabama and across Namibia. And another challenge I think that we saw is that these problems seem to be heightened for our younger learners, your, pre your pre primary and primary school students. And a lot of that just had to do with what their age group was. It's difficult to get a younger child to just sit in front of that computer while you're talking to the child. And so those were some of the struggles that we had here in the US and continue to have with our younger students. Okay. Are there any questions or comments? There was something from Gabriel, and I would like him to ask it because he has BYOD, where I come okay. from, the D stands for something else, so I need to read it himself, to, to say it himself. Please, Gabby, if you're there.
Well, BYOD in my terminology means bring your own device. So instead of the school giving you a computing device, you bring your own. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. I just wanted him to ask the question. So he's asking how well it's working. Let me see. How well has the bring your own device policy worked for you at uh, University of Alabama? Well, so at the University of Alabama, uh, <clears throat> most students do have this at the college level. Most students do have their computers. So that's the expectation. They have a laptop, they have a tablet, and in the worst case scenario, they have a smartphone. We also have libraries where they can check out computers if they don't have them. But we, um, uh, the cost of a computer, I think is included in our cost of attendance. It's at our primary and secondary schools where we have these one-to-one -one initiatives. Because usually in these schools, and students don't necessarily have their own computers. So they have to get funding in order to buy these machines. And as you can, can as you can, let me go back. If you look at this, if you look at this map of Alabama, I can tell you, I don't, I don't even have to know this, but I can tell you where the one and one to one initiatives are working well. They're working up here. Why is that? This is a high industrial area with a whole bunch of people with, a, with some money. We got some over here that are working in the Tuscaloosa area. How do I know that? Because you got some high earning people. You got a lot of schools with a lot of money. Okay, it's working right over here. Well, this is another college town. You got a lot of schools with a lot of money. So they got one-to-one -one initiative. This is not a hard problem. The people who have it are the people in the communities with the money. The people who don't have it are the people in the communities without the money. Now that's 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 being very general because I mean yeah because you will find some 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 communities have one to ones that have been funded that they've gotten grant money to do it, but uh, where you find these uh, these uh, implementations are typically in your more your well resourced areas. And well resourced typically means money. So you don't typically find these in your poorer communities. And I think you could probably say the same thing for the University of Namibia, I mean, for Namibia. Your one-to-one -one initiatives are gonna be uh, here in Windhoek, or they're gonna be over here in Swakopmund, <clears throat> or they're gonna be, I don't know, they're gonna be, they're gonna be where the money is typically because that's where you have all the associated resources. So that just kind of, well, so what I said is that the challenges that we faced with COVID were not new challenges. They're just old challenges that we forgot about. And that is, is that we have a digital divide, which says that some people have access at school and at home and other people don't which says that some people have technology skills uh, and access and some people don't. And it says that some schools are ready for teaching and learning online and other schools aren't. And if you get down to the basis of it, schools who were doing one-to-one -one initiatives before COVID hit, you can imagine those schools were more ready for uh, emergency remote teaching or this online teaching than those schools that weren't. Because the teachers and the students were already familiar with the devices. They were already using those devices um, for teaching and learning. So that, that, that migration for them was a lot easier. Schools who were integrating a lot of technology, who were, who were doing a high level of technology integration before COVID, they fared better after COVID. Why? During the, during the lockdown, why? Because they already had experience using these tools and they already had experience using them for teaching and learning. We still had our home access issues and those just, those just came up from everywhere. And then, you know, when we started thinking about lockdowns and schools, we found ed tech wasn't our biggest challenge. Our biggest challenge was where do kids eat who used to eat at school? Where do kids study whose home life is not conducive to studying. Those are the kinds of things that we began to find as issues. 
but I really don't think we had we we came up with anything new. I think what COVID did was expose the problems that we have forgotten about. And that problem is that education is not an equal playing field. The good thing, I think, is that um, you know, people started to address those problems. Well, you can't, you couldn't run away from access when it was very, very clear that everybody needed it. So uh, even in the US and in Namibia, they begin to give students hotspots. They begin to give students access to computers. At the University of Namibia, the school, the students started a computer drive because all the students didn't have computers. So they started a computer drive to get students for those, to get computers for those students who didn't have it. And they were looking for, I think like 5,000 computers or something. So it just, it really surfaced in my opinion, the problems that we already have. And so my question that I ended up with was knowing what we know about the, the digital divide, how did we think that some of these emergency remote teaching solutions would work? How did we think that they would work given the, the same, the digital divide problem that we still have? And then my next question is, where do we go from here? Uh-oh, I thought I talked too, oh, I don't talk too long. I'm sorry. Uh, our EdTech future, um, what we have done is we have forefronted social justice issues. We have to accept that online learning is not yet a universal answer. There's still room for TV. There's still room for radio as we begin to make inroads in making sure that everybody has the access that they need. We made some access gains and we made some technology integration gains because people are doing tech integration who haven't, doing, who haven't done it before. People have access that they didn't have before. So how do we expand that? How do we maintain it and expand it even after the lockdown is over, even as we go back to our classrooms? How do we do that? And I think one way that we do that, and this is sort of where I wrap up, one way that we do that is that we begin to say that our problems are the same problems. Why are we working on these problems separate from each other? So what I would like to see is more collaborative, cross-national uh, technology uh, solutions. And one of those might be what kind of professional development, collaborative professional development can we do that builds on the experiences that we've had in this COVID environment? So not only is it just Namibia, not only is it just Sub-Saharan Africa, but how do we do things where we can bring people, you know, across Africa becomes cross-national, but then cross-continent. How do we begin to look at if the U.S. and Namibia are having similar problems, how can the U.S. and Namibia work on those problems together and come up with common solutions? Anyway, that's the end of my story. And I have talked a whole hour. So we don't have a lot of, so what are we gonna do about questions and comments and discussion? We can take a few. Uh, thank you so much, Angela. Um, it was worth it, but remember you're also taking some questions in between. Okay. So it's, it's, it's wonderful. I like um, your statement there, what if the roadblocks are actually hidden opportunities? Yes. And I think if you look at the, at the other side of COVID, there are actually a few good things that have happened because of COVID. So yes. uh, it's not all bad um, in, yes. in education, yeah. Yes. So I think we open up questions to uh, whoever has a question, please, whoever has a question, please just either raise your hand or take the mic and speak to us. You can unmute yourself um, and, and uh, just ask a question. Yes, Gutema, please uh, unmute and ask. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. I thank you, Dr. Njela, for your presentations. Thank you. My question is, uh, is this the last option online teaching during the COVID pandemic? The last option? Is it the last option? Yes. Mm, I don't, let me see, help me. I don't think I understand the question. Like, 
Can you ask it again, uh, Gutama? Okay, okay. The solution for education is online type learning. Since it is and you are fading. You are, Gutama, you are fading. Every time you talk, you are fading away. Please stay on the mic so that we can hear you, please. Okay. Are you hearing me now? Yes. Yes. Conducting education as the last time is not possible now, since it is COVID is pandemic. For well, this solution, for this solution, online is online is one. This is online teaching is the last option, for the last solution for the. Well, I don't uh, think now. This is just me personally, and I'm open to other people having different ideas. Yes. I think that online teaching is an easy answer. And I think that if everybody had access in terms of access to the internet and everybody had a computer, I think that would be our solution. But if they yes. don't, I don't see I, how that's the solution. Yes, I understand your, uh, your description, but there is a challenge behind this. There's there a is, challenge? Yeah. Go ahead. There is a challenge. For example, yes. is there, there is no time, there is no access, especially in Africa. This is a very challenge. Yes, yes. So no. why, yes. Why, why we prepare offline setup, such as there is some offline education? Look, when we take Moodle, it is online, some part of offline. When it is prepared offline, when a student takes it is on your platform, such as mobile, tablet, laptop, everybody can access right. at home without infrastructure. Right. There is no such type of applications, no? Right. Well, there are some applications. Some people are beginning to say, well, everybody doesn't have ac uh, access online. There's a... There's a, oh, it's called Calibre. I'm, I think, I'm, am I spelling that right? Uh, Google has gotten together with some people and they have recognized that everybody doesn't have access. So what they have done is they have created some, some applications that you can download when you're in an area with access, but that runs on your computer when you're in areas that don't have access. So is everybody familiar with Khan Academy? Khan Academy now has a version. I think this thing is called Calibre. And I don't have it, Irene, but I can find it if that's not it. And what you can do is if you're in an area, let's say you can go to the city. And if you can download this software, you can actually have a Khan Academy on your computer. And you can take that computer back to your school and if your, if your computers are networked, even in the school, you can, you can put that Khan Academy on your computers in your, lab, in your lab, if you have one, or on your personal computer, if you have one. And you can access Khan Academy without having the internet. But interestingly enough, one of the things that I had my students in Namibia do, you know, because they were the ones facing these challenges because they were teachers. And so I asked them, what do you think, what would have been a better answer? And so they talked about a lot of different things. And, you know, one person said, well, we just need to make sure we get up all the, all the internet towers, the access towers that we need so that everybody can have access to the internet. And then they said, well, some people said, well, we need to build roads so that people can get from the, easily from their home to the school. And then some people said, well, we need to build more hostels so that when something like this happens, the students can stay at school because they're not gonna have access in their village. And some people said, and some people actually did this um, in other places. They went for younger kids, especially. They, they went to television and radio delivery of learning rather than internet delivery of learning. So I think that we have to, when we, when, when we have these problems, we have to realize, we have to think about who our population is. Because if we don't, we're, gonna, we're going to exacerbate the
the economic inequalities that exist already in our communities. And we're going to make poor people poor and rich people richer. And I know poor and rich are not good, but we're going to make poor people poorer. And that's not how an economy grows. We got to figure out a way that everybody can move forward. Okay, I, that was a long answer. I'm sorry. Anybody else want to say something? Anybody else got Somebody a comment? Else? Oh, well, one thing that a colleague at the University of Namibia said to me, and this is something that we're finding in the US as well, and it goes along, Irene, with what you said. Um, uh, he said that he had observed that colleagues who didn't want to use Moodle in the past, who didn't want to do anything with technology in the past, they are more open to it now. After they've seen some of the tools that we've used, they now want to use those in their face-to-face -face classes. And this is the kind of thing that the literature tells us. The literature tells us that if you give people experience with these tools and they see how those tools can be helpful, they will want to use them. But in a lot of cases, we couldn't even get people to try them. So he's seeing that as a positive going forward. And that's what I mean about being able to maintain and expand the gains that we've made. Because as Irene said, we have made some gains. We've made some gains in access. More people have access today than they had before the lockdown. We have made access in terms of technology integration. More teachers are integrating technology now or know how to, to some level than before the lockdown. So our question is, how do we build on that for the future? But we got to recognize that solutions only work if they are solutions that we give that, that the population needs. Okay, anybody else, Irene? Um, hi, Irene. Hi, hi, Valetza. Please go on. Okay. Hi, Dr. Angela. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, most of the things that you said really resonates with what is also happening on our side in, in West Africa. And I might say that what you mentioned about the population that we are working for becomes relevant, that we need to understand them is very key. Because as you were presenting, I was just sitting here listening to feedback survey from our students on, on how they experienced the COVID learning online. And uh, one of them had said that um, they have actually experienced a lot of burnout. So the, the university should consider maintaining their previous um, CWAs and um, um, we, uh, consider how they are even assessed in these times because if they do not have access to all these resources then it's also not fair to them if we assess them on the same measure as we would when we had the the normal um teaching and learning practices so to some degree i think that um going forward like you said we should really consider what we have and what we would like to do with it or what we can do with it and not make things look like everything is fine and try to demand so much also from our learners because we may not have made all the provisions for them to be able to perform in the way that we wish them to do. So that is the bit I want to, to add to it. And uh, thank you so much, um, Dr. Angela, for your presentation. I, and I appreciate that comment that you've made. Oh, it just breaks my heart. How can we hold students to the same thing when their whole environment has changed? You know, when they, your comment, your comment should be played about five times a day for everybody to hear it. Thank you so much for saying that. What we did at the University of Alabama, and I don't think they did this at the University of Namibia, but they did make some changes. At the University of Alabama, what we did is, we usually have a letter grade system where you make A, B, C, D, and F. What they did uh, in the, the, when we first went down under the, pand under the lockdown, they said students had an opportunity to either get that letter grade or just take a pass fail. And they said the students could do that so that, you know, if they weren't doing as well as they normally do, it wouldn't affect their GPA. So if you usually get an A, but you were gonna get a C this time because of some troubles that you were having with uh, this remote learning, that you could just take a pass and that wouldn't affect your grade point average. 
in the unit at the University of Namibia, some things that they started to do was, you know, exams, uh, final exams or a big thing that, uh, yeah, the, the exams. And so what they started to do is say, okay, you don't have to give exams. You can do continuous assessment activities and let those count for the exams. So those are some of the things that they're doing. And even doing that, you know, is major because exams is sort of what the world turns on. And for them to say that in some cases, you didn't have to give exams, uh, that you could use CA or add another CA or use an existing CA. And that means continuous assessment. And I'm, I'm assuming everybody understands that. But uh, thank you so much for that comment. We have a comment from Brigetti. I don't know if you're in a position to take the, the mic and just speak even if it's just uh, one word or two. Are you in a position to take the mic, Brigetti? I would Greetings understand. from Cape Town, everyone. Hello. Oh, hi. Yes, okay, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I think, you know, my, my, what I said in the comments sort of covers it. Um, you know, the one point was that the pandemic has opened up opportunities for people that were previously disadvantaged because of the misguided thinking that you have to be on site in order to, you know, to, to learn or in order to, to do a job. Um, and that is, you know, COVID-19 has taught us that that simply isn't true. And then the other point that I wanted to make that I also posted in the comment is this, the psychological effects that it's had on people, um, both, both educators, um, workers and students alike, irrespective of age or social status. Um, it has affected the way people perform and we can't discount that that is something that needs to be considered. Well, how do you think it's, it's affected the way people perform? Um, well, I think, you know, we're doing so much online and, you know, there's a thing called Zoom fatigue and that is real, that is, you know, that is absolutely um, something that is real, you know, fatigue from um, a way of learning that we're not used to. Many people are not used to it um, and it's exhausting. People don't realize how much um, screen time can affect your ability to function because you have to focus on so many things instead of you know when you're having a a conversation with one person you try to observe that person's um body language you're trying to observe what it is they're trying to convey to you and you focus on one on, on one set of eyes but in a zoom setting you focus on so many people there's so many distractions and your brain literally gets fried because you thinking you, you you've you've got so much things to view at the same time and to observe and try and focus so it's a lot more exhausting um on people and i think you know more so for younger learners than than older learners or people that have um problems you know um focusing so especially yeah. children and people that have learning disabilities of any kind, it may be a real challenge for them. I, I, I totally agree with you. I've started, I've, because I've started to start some of my classes by saying, I hate Zoom. I think I have <laughs> to stop doing that. <laughs> That's probably not good for the students. But uh, I think, um, mm. you, know, and, you know, I'm an online learning person. So I know how to design an online course. That's not a big thing for me. I know how to do that. But you know what I don't know how to do? I, don't, I know how to design an online course for people who, who live in a face-to-face -face world who are stepping out of that world for a minute to take this online course. I don't know how to design an online course for people who are living online. And some people say, well, there's no difference. But I think that there is. I think that I think that even the way we think about what an online course looks like, we should be thinking differently, knowing that people are spending 75% of their time online as opposed to 15% uh, of their time online. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what the right answer is. I don't, and that's because anytime you do 
uh, design, you have to design to context. And so the design that we have done have, has all considered us to be in a face-to-face -face world. And now in this COVID environment, we haven't been in a face-to-face -face world. We've been in a world where my work happens on Zoom, where my learning happens on Zoom, where my meetings with my, with my, with my parents and extended family happens on Zoom, where we're just living, and I'm using Zoom as an example, where that's the space that we're living in. And I don't know, I hope we don't have to live in that space much longer, but I think that good online learning is different in this environment than it would be generally. And that's just me. Anyway, anybody else? As you, as you can see, I can talk myself silly. I like to agree with that. You know, I think there needs to be education of the educators in terms of how to effectively teach online as opposed to simply duplicating what they did in the classroom. Because that same learning method is not effective and it can't work um, online. And I think another factor, you know, I'm, I'm very much, and I'm, I'm sorry that my camera is not on because I'm, I'm, I am multitasking at the moment and I'm not really camera ready. But, um, but what I wanted to say is, you know, if, if I, I've been doing online work for the last three and a half years. And so, you know, for me, being on camera is not a big deal, but I can tell you that it took me a good six months before I finally felt comfortable on, uh, on camera. You know, it took a lot of work to get to that point. And what we've done here is, is we've taken people who literally had a fear of being on camera and a total aversion, and we forced them into something that they didn't have time to adapt to. And those same people are having to teach other students and young people who also didn't have that learning curve so how can they teach people to feel comfortable online if they themselves haven't had that training? Exactly. And because we were working in an emergency situation, there was no time for that training. So what you learned is you learned it by doing it. So, and I guess a good thing could be is that everybody was learning together, but um, it was an emergency. And I guess what that says is that we need to have emergency plans. So that when something happens, we're more ready for it than we were for this. But that was an excellent comment. Thank you. Anybody else? Irene? I, I, I actually am enjoying the conversation. I know we are over the hour. Um, uh, so we can continue the conversation in our Facebook page, uh, the Maj Africa Facebook page, and on Twitter um and on you know um other spaces that that are possible i have shared um let me see i am sharing the facebook page you can also join um a, you know uh emerge africa uh to be a member so that you can see all these wonderful events that we organize um we are really grateful that you're here today um, because we are over the hour, we will, we'll, um, you know, just let it go and then we'll continue the conversation elsewhere. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Angela Benson for being and here. thank you for having me and thank and you for so talking with me. <laughs> yes, and we are so happy. So thank you everybody also for joining us today. We appreciate you and we'll see you next week. We have another session um uh, with um nicola uh dr nicola palet um uh, professor karen from eshwatini and with uh Nud nodumo from the aau so we hope to see you then okay so bye for now and thank you everyone for being here bye thank you bye everyone bye thank you bye, bye, bye. i enjoyed it Bye, Thank you Bye. Great presentation. Thank you. And we have to keep in touch. That's Guatemala. Good time. Good time. Bye, everyone. Hi. <laughs> That's been a wonderful time, too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I had a great time.
your, your some you. names. I, I try to avoid some names because uh, they come out in my mother tongue and my, they might not be oh. the right way yeah. to say them, but uh, I'm sure you, you're you okay with that, yeah? You too. Mm. You too. Thank Bye. you so Thank much. You, you can, would you like Thank to you, say I... something, Chinasa? I can see your hand is up. We are still here. I just wanted the people who would have wanted to leave on the yeah, hour to, to yes. go. Uh -huh. Your hand is up, Chinasa. Can you hear me? Oko? Your hand is up, so I'm, I'm wondering if you wanted to say something. You're, you're, uh, you need to unmute. You need to unmute. Unfortunately, I can't unmute you. Um, let me see if I can unmute you. Yes, I have unmuted you. Go ahead. Thank you. God bless you. You need to unmute Oko if you're going to. Hello, speak. Irene. Hi, Felicia. I like. Hello. Yes, Thank tell you us. Tell us. Been a great time. You look like you're Hello. walking. Yes, we yes, can. Yes, I'm outside trying to track the network. <laughs> <laughs> you, we, we have. Oh, it's so nice to have you. And these are the usual, the the, the struggles that I think Dr. Angela was talking about. That uh, connectivity is a big, big problem. So yeah, yeah please talk to yeah. us. It's a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> big deal. Thank you, Professor Angela. It has been a wonderful time. Oh, I really yeah. enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Irene, for the wonderful facilitation, too. Oh, thank you. I appreciate. Thank you, thank you everyone, for being it's, there. It's so great to meet you. I hate I didn't get a chance to come to Nigeria. So thank you. I'm expecting you. <laughs> yeah. We are friends that we are going to have a, a conducive atmosphere for every one of us to meet face to face. Nevertheless, we thank God for the the Zoom and other facilities we are making use of and taking advantage of them at this particular time. It has yeah. really been a wonderful time. I've seen your, the comparison of both different universities. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, she, yeah, uh, yeah, her connection like is not so good. similar. Yeah, our connection is not very good. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I know Gabriel uh, from um, Zambia is here, but he says he cannot speak. So we thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Thank you so um, much. Felicia, you've frozen. I think you walked too far. You oh. walked too far from, from the network. So you froze. So you need to, to find the tree. You need to find that tree, <laughs> that spot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's quite a challenge. But thank you so okay. much. We appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now, this, these now. are the things I was talking about, about the advantages of, of, of COVID on the other side, because we actually get to meet each other more often than we would have met face to face, even if it's virtual, but we see each other yeah. more often, we ask each other how we are doing more often, and actually when the video is on, you can see that people are okay and like now, Felicia is sharing a, a video walking, so we know she's healthy and she's okay. <laughs> so that's, that's a good, yeah, that's a good thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really okay. a good thing. Yeah. Really okay, then. Thing. Thank you. We appreciate you. So we'll be um, uh, closing the room shortly. Okay. So thank you, everyone. And and thank you again, uh, Irene. I really, uh, I really appreciate it. Okay, we'll, we'll talk sometime. We'll keep okay, on talking great. and we'll see if we can follow up another presentation. Um, okay. uh, yeah, some other time. Hey, yes. is there any way you can send me the chat? Yes, I can. Yes, okay. I can. I would appreciate that. Okay. Yes, I will, I will clean it up. Okay. I usually remove the forms and the time and just leave the name and the, and the, and the what people said and then I can send it to you. Okay. Yes, please. Okay. I'll do Sounds that. great. Thank you. Oh, yes. I will bye -bye. share it with you. Okay. Bye. bye. For now. Thank you. Bye, bye Felicia. Bye, Felicia. Bye. Yes. Yeah. Bye, Angela. Bye, bye Alicia. Bye, Gabby. Bye, Nicola. Everybody.
Bye. <laughs> okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, Felicia. So good to see you again. So thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Valitza, and thank you for being here. We appreciate you. Yeah, sure, Irene. Okay, then. Much Bye. love. Good to see okay. you. Bye. <laughs>